Welcome to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar for our first barstool chat. My idea for these episodes is that I want to talk to some of the scientists who have spoken at our events and get to know more about them as people and also find out what inspired them to do science in the first place. The first one of these interviews is with Dr. Larry Sherman, who is a neuroscientist at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. He's also a longtime friend who has spoken at many, many of our events. The most recent one was our first Science on Tap online event that was held on April 9, 2020, on the topic of music and the anxious brain. And this interview took place about 20 minutes after we finished that event. Larry has been a good friend for years, but I learned some new stuff about him during this interview that made me like him even more. So let's get started. Can you tell us who you are and what kind of science you do? And specifically, what does your lab work on? Yeah, so my name is Larry Sherman. I am a professor of neuroscience at the Oregon Health Sciences University and also at the Oregon National Primate Research Center. And I'm also president of the Society for Neuroscience uh, for the state of Oregon and for Southwest Washington. And I run a research laboratory that is focused on understanding, our, our really our main focus, I would say, is understanding um, the substance called myelin in the brain. Myelin is a, a material that wraps around nerve cells and increases the speed that nerve cells conduct their impulses. And we're interested in it because um, in certain diseases like multiple sclerosis, it becomes destroyed. Also, it turns out that quite a bit of myelin is damaged in Alzheimer's disease. There's also a lot of conditions where myelin fails to form, including children who are born very prematurely. I have a colleague who I work with named Stephen Back, who's a child neurologist, and we're trying to understand ways to help children who are born very premature and have sort of premature brain injury. When you have that happen, one of the things that happens is you develop cerebral palsy if you survive it. Hmm. So we have actually identified molecules in the brain that build up which are probably helpful early on in an injury like that, but they stick around because the brain's really bad at clearing stuff out. And as a result of these molecules staying around, it, uh, it they prevent a signal actually to cells that should be coming in and turning into new cells that make myelin, and they prevent it from happening. Hmm. And so our last several years, we've been really working on developing strategies to overcome that process. And so far, we just had a very exciting paper published recently showing that the strategy works, at least in mice. And so out of the primate center in Oregon, we have a population of monkeys that spontaneously are just beautiful animals. They're Japanese snow monkeys. Um, and they spontaneously develop a disease that looks pretty similar to multiple sclerosis in humans. And so one of the things we're trying to do is see if we can rescue this disease in those monkeys using this strategy. And if we can get that to work in the monkeys, if we can fix the monkeys, we have a really good chance of taking that to a clinical trial in humans. Very cool. And I feel like I should know the answer to this, but what is the difference between a neuroscientist and a neurologist? So a neuroscientist is someone who studies things about the brain and the nervous system uh, at the cellular, the molecular, the behavioral level, all these different levels. A neurologist is someone who sees patients who have neurological diseases. Um, And so they could do research, but it would probably be clinical research, although some of our MBPhDs, of course, who do both. But a neurologist technically is someone who sees patients with neurological diseases and hopefully uses information from nerds like me um, uh, (laughs) eventually that will help them give you new treatments or ways to diagnose disease for their patients. Okay, that makes sense. How did you get interested in science? What, What brought you to neuroscience? Well, neuroscience in specific, it's kind of a funny story. So I grew up in La Jolla, California. I was uh, really lucky. I used to go to the beach all the time. I used to, you know, hang out with surfers. And uh, I lived very close to the campus of the University of California, San Diego. And this was in the 70s. And my friends and I would ride our bikes through that campus all the time. And what was awesome was nobody locked their doors back then. And so we'd run through the campus and come across a building and just drop our bikes off and wander into the building until somebody threw us out. Um, So we got to see a lot of really cool stuff in these spaces. And one day I was riding my bike by myself and came across a building that I'd just never seen before. And I wandered in and about halfway down the hallway, there was a door open and I looked in and there was a guy sitting at a desk holding a human brain in his hands. And I was just frozen looking at this, right? Because I'd never seen a brain before. I was in ninth grade, right? And uh, I probably was sitting there 
frozen for 30 seconds before he finally looked up and said, would you like to come in and see this? And I always tell people, it's like, you know, my mom always said, don't take candy from strangers. <laughs> but uh, she never said anything about brains. So I, I went in. Right. Um, the guy was a fellow by the name of Robert Livingston, who at the time was the foremost uh, neuroanatomist uh, studying the structure of the brain in the, in the United States. He was also um, one of the early directors of the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. And he was an incredibly generous, incredibly gregarious fellow. He um, showed me this, this brain. He told me about how, his research. And he uh, found out that I was going to a math, science, and computer uh, magnet school in San Diego and uh, asked me if I'd be interested in working in his lab, like after school. Wow. When in ninth grade? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I said, yeah, sure. You know, and I uh, got my parents convinced that that was an okay thing to do. And what I did in his lab turned into science fair projects. Um, I got to go to the international science fair twice. If you've ever seen that science fair movie, I was one of those geeky kids with a suit and a tie trying to impress these judges about the work that I did. And, uh, that actually, uh, through that, I actually won enough scholarship funds to pay for my first two years of college and got a lot of other opportunities to start doing science. And so that's really what got me started. This is just an opportunity arose and I took it. Wow, that's really, uh, what an impact that person had on your life. That's really remarkable. Yeah, and I mean, not only was he just gregarious, but he was also an amazing teacher. He had a great vision way beyond what other people were doing. His idea was actually he wanted to digitize human brains. Hmm. What he was doing was he was uh, taking slices through the brain and then digitizing them and then recreating them in these 3D structures that could be analyzed for changes. And so he wanted to say, okay, why is an Alzheimer's brain different from a non-Alzheimer's brain, for example? Why is the brain of somebody who's really smart different from somebody who is having low IQ? You know, those types of questions. And the work was just really way ahead of its time. The computer power was not even one one thousandth what we have now, but he made it work. And it was really cool. Yeah, I imagine, I don't know when MRIs became a thing, but I imagine that was a long this was time way before, before that. MRIs, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. So I know that you are, we were just talking right before we started this interview about you uh, judging for a science fair tomorrow. And that I can understand why that is important to you. So you do that a lot, right? I've always taken the opportunity to, to volunteer as a judge for science fairs here in Portland and also back in San Diego when I've been home during the science fair. I feel like I owe it to people. I, it's giving back. Um, and I'm very passionate about science education, as are you, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, It's a good thing I, we can work together. <laughs> yeah, well, my involvement has gone even beyond that. So I, when my, my uh, oldest uh, child was in elementary school, I realized that they just didn't have a lot of opportunities to really do real science in the elementary schools here. So I started a science fair workshop and a science fair at our local elementary school just down the road from where I live. And that was now 16 years ago. And I'm, I don't have any kids at the school anymore, but I'm still doing it. And it's, it's for me, it's a lot of fun just mm -hmm. seeing these kids come up with ideas. And that's their challenge, right? They have to do something new. You can't just say, how does a volcano work? They have to do something new, like okay, what is the effect of uh, Mount St. Helens ash on plant growth or that kind of thing where they can actually do something and test a hypothesis and come up with a project that's really new. And they come up with great ideas and they're so cool. And they actually learn how to do amazingly in fifth grade things like standard deviations uh, to understand error in their, in their data and everything else. And it's just so cool for me to see year after year uh, these kids going off. And they compete against sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at the State Science Fair and actually win awards, which is amazing. That's amazing. But, um, but yeah, but then I get to judge the high school students and the projects they do just blow my, blow my mind every year. Mm -hmm. And I just love the fact that we have so many kids who are, even at that age, passionate about science the way I was when I was that age. That's really fascinating. And, and I really like that about you, um, passing it on. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. And you mentioned your kids, and obviously in the presentation that we just gave, uh, one of your children helped up with the presentation um, by singing. And you do a lot of music, and you've given several presentations related to music. And, and I'm wondering what your background in music is. When did you start playing piano, and, and what's your interest there? So according to my mom, I, uh, the first time I sat down at a piano was uh, the night after our family had gone to this outdoor theater in San Diego and watched the musical Brigadoon. 
And uh, apparently I came home, the story goes, and you know, my mom tends to exaggerate, um, but the, the story goes that I came home and I started playing the music, just the melody in my right hand. But, mm-hmm. So I do play by ear. I, I, if I hear a song, I can play it pretty much. And uh, I took piano lessons for a number of years. Uh, my piano teacher got really frustrated with me because she found out that I'd go and listen to something and play it instead of reading the music. <laughs> Um, and at one point told me, you know what, you should go off and join a rock band or something and, uh, just go enjoy yourself. And I did. So I was, I played in rock bands in high school and, uh, played in bands all through college and, and grad school and everything else. And, uh, uh, I really love it for me. It's, it's therapy and it's just, it's just a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, my, all three of my kids are quite nice. They all sing, they have beautiful voices and, uh, they play music and, um, I've really enjoyed that aspect of my life, just having music in it all the time. And uh, for talks and things, I find that if, if you can incorporate music or art into these very uh, information deep presentations on science, I think you connect with a broader audience. And I think that's a really effective way to use art and music and everything else. I think it's uh, a great way to connect with people or relate to it better. So I absolutely agree, which is why we keep doing these <laughs> music in the brain events. Um, I, I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, but you have given talks on uh, nature versus nurture and talking about your own family history of, of you being an adopted child and meeting some of your um, family members. There are so many fascinating things about that story, but one of the things is that uh, that really stuck with me is that you are in a medical related field or science related field and you're a musician and one of your brothers, I think is also in a medical related field and a musician. Is that? That's right. So I, I have, um, um, I had, unfortunately my uh, oldest sibling died a few years ago. There were a total of six of us who are all have the same mother. Uh, and two of us have a father in common and that's me and uh, my older brother, one, one of my older brothers. And, um, when I first met him, um, I was blown away because he had worked in a neurologist's office and um, we have very similar tastes in music. We have all these things in common. And what's amazing about us is the environments we grew up in with couldn't have been more different. So he grew up um, uh, in a farm and uh, I grew up in the La Jolla, right? Right. <laughs> with surfers around me and uh, his family were working class folks and, and you know, working folks that worked on the land and and my dad worked for IBM right so my mom was a stayed at home but she you know she worked at home but um again we had this kind of upper middle class lifestyle I was raised in a Jewish family um and his his family are um are not Jewish at all so mm-hmm. uh, and, uh in fact they they since joined the Mormon church so mm-hmm. you couldn't be more different and yet we have all these great things in common uh, I have two sisters who are just wonderful people. I love them both. And and then my two surviving brothers, one of them lives near him here in, in uh, not too far from Portland. And we've become very close. And I love him and his wife. It's like We've known each other forever. So it's it's been really wonderful. Getting yeah. To them. I, that's your brother that I've met. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's, he's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Um, so back to, to science uh, a bit. Do you have anything that you wish people knew about what it's like to be a scientist? <laughs> um, I, I, I tell my students this often. I, I, I feel like if you're going to do science, you really have to have a passion for it. It's not a nine to five job. It's, it's something that takes all of your time and your thought and your energy if you're going to do it right. So you really have to have a passion for it to do it. And I think most people... A lot of people today have this idea that we're all overpaid people who make a ton of money off of what we do. And there, there are certainly examples of that. But the majority of scientists are people who are passionately curious about the world and who are excited about the idea that they can come up with an idea for an experiment that's never been done before and make a discovery about something that's never been known before about nature. Right. And I think that's true for any scientist. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets me up in the morning, to be honest. Even now, when we're stuck in our homes during this (laughs) this pandemic that we're experiencing right now, I think just hearing about the latest experiment 
and knowing that we may discover something really exciting and really new that really, to me, is, is all my motivation. And being an academic scientist, at least, you know, it's, it, it involves cycles of coming up with ideas, generating uh, some early data to suggest that your idea may be right, and then applying for grants to various granting agencies and hoping above hope that somebody likes your grant enough that they'll give you a bunch of money, mm-hmm. try out this crazy idea that you may have, and then hoping that you do that your idea is right or that you can get some data out of this idea of yours that's going to inform the world about something new uh, and then convincing other people that what you've discovered is worthwhile and publishing it and then starting all over again. And so the hard part about being an academic scientist anyway, I think, is um, you are constantly begging for money. You're constantly having to, you know, be a salesman in a way and sell your ideas and get people excited about your work and your research. And then going back to the drawing board again and again and again. But the best part about that is it's you. It's your ideas. You get to do something really new and novel that no one's done before. You get to travel around the world and meet other colleagues who are interested in similar things. Um, and it's it's a great buzz. Um, it really is. But if you don't have a passion for it, it's not something you want to do. You make it all sound so very attractive. <laughs> well, you know what? I... I have to say, I mean, there are days where um, you're, you feel like you're banging your head against a wall, both in terms of the grantsmanship or in terms of experiments that you just thought were going to be really straightforward and weren't, um, and technical problems arise that you just don't anticipate. But there's other days where, like, you know, the experiment works great and you get this fantastic data and you want to just pop a bottle of champagne because it's like, wow, this is really cool. That, for me, is why I love science. And I think most people who do science, even in, in industry, in, in uh, biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies, you know, I think they do it because they have a passion for it. And that, that's a different environment, of course, compared to academic sciences when you look at pharmaceutical companies. But, but you're still doing scientific research. You're still doing discovery mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And it's all about making those discoveries. That leads to my what will probably be my final question of... What is going on in the world of science today that gets you most excited? It, it could be related to neuroscience or something else entirely, but what what is really intriguing to you right now? I uh, I could not possibly put a finger on one single thing that I think is exciting right now. I can I, I mean, for me, you know, the accelerated pace at which discoveries are being made in just about every field are amazing. Um, the use of artificial intelligence right now, for example, to help diagnose disease. Mm-hmm. I think that's just really interesting. I think it still needs to be validated and shown to be accurate and helpful. But I just, the more of these data I see, the more it's informing whole new areas of science to be able to do that. I would say probably one of the things I'm really excited about right now in neuroscience are recent discoveries using, again, brain imaging. Our ability to now actually understand processes almost at the molecular level in living brains and to see things like one, there was a study that came out out of Glasgow. I think it was last year where um, they showed that you could use certain types of imaging patterns to predict patients who had anxiety and depression and who would benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy and who would not based on this imaging. And to me, that's amazing, right? So and it, it seemed to be work. It seemed to be predictive for about eighty percent of patients, as I recall. That to me is is incredible because that so many patients who suffer from anxiety and depression spend a lot of time in these therapies. And if you knew ahead of time that it was going to help you, it would save you a lot of time and trying to find an alternative. And and that to me is just incredibly exciting. So these types of things, these developments that are going from the bench to the bedside so much more quickly to me are just remarkable. I've had to throw away almost all my notes from graduate school because so many of our paradigms and the dogma of the day has proven to be not quite right. And um, our, what we're discovering makes it just that much more exciting. Which is the whole point of science, right? To uh, test things and find new evidence and change your your ideas about things based on that new evidence, Right. Absolutely. And that's, like I said, that's what, get me, that's what gets me up in the morning. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Larry. I, uh, I've i learned so much about you. I've known you for a long time, but this has been <laughs> enlightening. So thank you for this. Yeah, thanks a lot. And, and like I said, I hope this is going to be a jumping board for more of these because it's really great that you're doing this. 
And if you want to do it again, let me know. I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. You can find out more about our Science on Tap online events by visiting us on Facebook at Science on Tap O-R-W-A. Also, we plan to keep the podcast and our Science on Tap online events free and accessible to everybody, but we can't sell tickets to our live events anymore, so we don't have any income. I know a lot of people are struggling financially right now, and I certainly don't want to take anything away from anyone else. But if you value what we do and you have a little extra to spare, we'd be grateful for your support. We've started a Patreon account with our nonprofit partner, Make You Think, and you can find that at patreon.com slash make you think. And I'll put links to all of that in the episode notes. As always, I want to say thanks to my friends and volunteers who helped run the Science on Tap online events with Larry, including Chris Gowan, Rita Nigren, Steve Perry, and especially Scott Fry and Chelsea Schuyler. None of this would happen without them. A special thanks to Graham Tully for audio production. And also, thanks to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our theme music. And you're just in time.